The 90s had something special happening in regards to America and its view on war. 1998 saw the release of what are considered two of the most influential World War II films, Saving Private Ryan and The Thin Red Line. However, both of these movies tackle their subject matter in vastly different ways, both on a technical and thematic level. Our previous video discussed Saving Private Ryan's cinematography and how it aimed to mimic the feeling of combat how its narrative opened the discussion for the gray air of war, and how those components of the movie may or may not be used for propaganda. I highly encourage you to go watch that video and film, as we will draw some connections and point out some contrast here. When you have seen both movies, you might be asking, how is it possible that these movies were released in the same year? It is odd how similar, yet vastly different, these two movies are, and given their lasting influence, I think it's valuable to ask ourselves, why did Saving Private Ryan and The Thin Red Line release at the same time? Also, what do they reveal about the different ways that humans, specifically Americans, view and approach war? Well, let's explore that. Welcome to Analysis with Alex, your online media studies classroom. Terrence Malick's Thin Red Line is a war movie that transcends what many audiences expect a war movie to be. The Thin Red Line is a war movie in the same sense Apocalypse Now is a war movie. It is more so about the essence of war and its relation to the human condition than about the actual battle of Guadalcanal. Saving Private Ryan is more concerned about certain values and how those values appear in the most desperate, trying, and objectively awful situations. The Thin Red Line is more concerned about the nature behind those values and the nature behind the abject terror and turmoil of war. It takes the themes of sacrifice and salvation, adds a frame of existential and theological questions behind them, and pairs it with unconventional filming methods and cinematography. What does The Thin Red Line reveal to us about the human condition and war? We are going to break down The Thin Red Line into some major creative decisions used. Malik and his crew's use of natural lighting, shots of nature, and their creative approach in doing so, as well as characters surrounding certain ideologies and outlooks on human nature, and finally the themes of ambiguity, faith, survival, and nature. The film focuses on ideologies that are embodied by different characters who are then thrown into situations where they find their worldviews conflicting with each other and creating tension. The title itself seems to embody this approach, as it possibly refers to a poem from Kipling in which he describes British foot soldiers as, quote, the thin red line of heroes, or it refers to an old Midwestern saying that states, quote, there's a thin red line between the sane and the mad. Both of these were used as epigraphs for the novel the movie is based on. Let's look at those strange random shots of nature. The movie tends to follow this structure as it seemingly wanders around. Its opening shot is simply an alligator existing in nature, a primordial beast that naturally exists perhaps like war itself. Shots like this establish the film as an organic, natural exploration of its subject matter. This approach gives the movie the sensation of floating with its voiceovers musing when juxtaposed to more conventionally constructed scenes involving characters conversing or combat scenarios. The cinematography uses entirely natural lighting, and then juxtaposes these shots and segments depicting the turmoil of human-made war. This approach to the movie's cinematography is central to its theme of nature being perceived as cruel, as well as finding peace in the natural order of life. Looking at moments like this alligator, birds fluttering, or even just plants trying to harvest sunlight, then reflects back into the human characters, thus inviting us to wonder, are humans naturally cruel, or can humans embody peace and nature together? There have been various reports of how many of these shots were captured. In short, Malik would sometimes stop major scenes that required huge set designs and coordination to film something like birds. Thomas Flight covers this free-flowing, unstructured approach to filming that Malik's cinematography has become known Known for. There's a link to his video in the description below. We are given these shots of plants and animals in perhaps the same way Malik and his crew saw them. Much like the interior monologues of all the soldiers, these shots just happen to jump in, reminding the viewer that this film is exploring something deeper than the philosophies these characters are dreaming up. Nature, with a capital N, is forever present despite our human-made war, so much so that perhaps our wars, 
turmoil, suffering, and sin are just the side effect of it. Is our existence, which the thin red line frames as the grace of God or faith in God, or at least some type of higher power, a part of nature, or is it separate from nature? This is where the varying ideologies come into play. And though there are a few throughout the film, we will focus on two major ones. Our first tension occurs between Private Wit and Sergeant Welsh. During their conversation after Wit's capture from being AWOL, Welsh mentions how this world is the only one. Wit, on the other hand, states that he has seen another world. There ain't no world but this one. You're on their top. I've seen another world. Sometimes I think it was just my imagination. Well, and you've seen things I never will. At this point in the film, we could assume that Whit may be referring to his peaceful, AWOL life among the natives of Guadalcanal. However, as the film progresses, it becomes clear that Whit is referring to more so a supernatural world, a space in which man and nature are in unison, existing together in harmony. Whit seems to acknowledge this world is not absent of conflict, but it does exist in harmony. Whit is anti-war, but he is also rather ambivalent about his surroundings. This is often seen through his commentary on the idea of the world having one soul and how long this soul has existed. A strong scene that emphasizes this point is Witt's commentary on the great evil as US troops push through a Japanese encampment. While the camera remains steady and seemingly flows throughout the chaos, Witt uses the language of nature to describe evil and conflict in the world. As we see moments of both violence and compassion occur, Witt questions how a conflict like this benefits the earth itself. And to Witt, the world is still separated in terms of light and darkness, hearkening back to the book of Genesis. Much of the art between Wit and Welsh also seems to draw inspiration from the book of Ecclesiastes, an often overlooked and disregarded book of the Bible. In Ecclesiastes 3, it states that there is, quote, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What does the worker gain from his toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on men. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the hearts of men, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from the beginning to end." end quote. As Witt's art continues, we are given another scene in which Welsh shares his views about survival and self yet again. I feel sorry for you, kid. Yeah? Yeah, a little. This army's gonna kill you. You're smart, you take care of yourself. There's nothing you can do for anybody else. You're just running into a burning house where nobody can be saved. What difference do you think you can make one single man in all this madness? If you die, it's going to be for nothing. There's not some other world out there where everything's going to be okay. It's just this one. Just this rock. Though Wit remains silent, the next shot provides an answer to Welsh's views. Dogs survive off the conflict and trees grow from it. The moon still rises and falls. Wit, though coming to terms with it over the course of the movie, does not believe his death will be in vain. This leads up to the final moments of the film in which Wit's death is in sacrifice for his fellow men, but he also experiences the calm before death he desires at the start of the film. Unlike what we may assume from a war narrative, Wit's faith does not weaken or his worldview become more apathetic. Rather, war and conflict have affirmed Witt's ideology and worldview in some way. He realizes the nature of the world, contaminated by sin, for what it is and how we exist in it. Welsh, on the other hand, is just beginning to realize this by the end of the film. He begins to walk away from his previous beliefs and towards something else. Though it may be somewhat unclear what that is, we know he has changed. The dichotomy Malik lays out between Witt and Welsh, I feel, can be summarized by the late and great Alan Watts in his book, The Wisdom of Insecurity. This is perhaps my favorite distinction drawn between belief
belief and faith. Quote, we must here make a clear distinction between belief and faith because in general practice, belief has come to mean a state of mind which is almost opposite of faith. Belief, as I use the word here, is the insistence that the truth is what one could leaf or wish to be. The believer will open his mind to the truth and on the condition that it fits in with his preconceived ideas and wishes. Faith, on the other hand, is an unreserved opening of the mind to the truth, whatever it may turn out to be. Faith has no preconceptions, it is a plunge into the unknown. Belief clings, but faith lets go." End quote. The other major source of conflict is between Colonel Tall and Captain Staros. Tall and Staros are also interested in capital and nature, but from a slightly different perspective. With Welsh and Wit, it is more so about the nature of things in the world in a general sense, including humankind. But with Tall and Staros, it is more so about how we connect with each other. Over time, Staros reveals he has a true devotion to the safety and well-being of his fellow men. Tall, on the other hand, has a devotion to their success. Though this is coded as his own success in the eyes of human authorities and the institutions he desires acceptance from, we get this from how both characters are framed in relation to other characters. When we first meet Tall, he is on top of a carrier with General Quintard. Very few soldiers exist around them, and they overlook Guadalcanal. Even when on the island, Tall is often only with the few soldiers even later on whenever everyone regroups. He's not framed like Staros, in which we were able to see other soldiers in the background near him and often having him converse with more than just one. These creative decisions allow Malik and his crew to already have both characters situated in the audience's mind whenever they appear on the screen. In terms of their conflicting ideologies, it is funny that Malik has Tall outright serve something larger, his country's military and other institutions associated with it, and Staros, who we actually see praying at one point, never really calls attention to something greater than himself outside of that scene. But his actions, when compared to the actions of Tall, say otherwise. Staros is constantly serving his men, appears reflective over the nature of war, and seems to grasp some understanding of what's one body idea. Tall, on the other hand, believes that the world is self-destructive and finds no value or remedy in meditating over such things. Malik ultimately uses juxtaposition to compare and contrast these characters. A personal favorite moment of mine is that both characters quote Homer or the Iliad at some point. Tall quotes Homer in reference to the dawn sky just before the assault on the Japanese bunker begins a central conflict in the movie. In an excellent article titled Terence Malick's The Thin Red Line, an Homeric Epic, Spectacle, Simile, Scene, and Situation, ancient and modern rhetoric scholar John Hesk focuses on this quote as framing the ensuing battle as mythic and spectacular at least for Tall. Because of Tall's allusion to Homer and his position of watching the battle from afar, Hess points out that Tall, quote, aestheticizes battle as well as Homer and nature. Malik offers images that are complicit in this aestheticization. For example, the smoke plums and orange flashes of the initial barrage offer an impressive counterpoint to the preceding stunning shots of the dawn sky. Many of the shots of men moving slowly and silently up the hill to higher positions also have a grace and beauty to them. At one point, we see an advancing platoon of men perform a series of ducks and swoops in unison as the nervousness of one soldier instantly transmits to the whole unit. They look like a flock of birds or a herd of deer responding instinctively to a threat." End quote. Hess goes on to compare these shots to descriptions found in the Iliad, where Greek armies were compared to flocks of geese and swans. Given that Malik and his crew filmed so much of the nature present, especially birds, these connections become even more strong. Overall, Hesk argues that this mythic, Homeric framework creates a thin red line to become a myth about American imperialism and about World War II, and I would argue, for war itself. Hesk and I too see the thin red line abandoning factual accounts of the Battle of Guadalcanal and its cinematography as pushing the movie into the practice of myth rather than a retelling of war stories. I will provide a link to Hesk's article in the description below. You should be able to download it for free. Staros, on the other hand, does not apply the mythic power of Homer to the battle, but instead to his fellow men. At the end of his time on Guadalcanal, after he has been fired from his post, he uses Homer to refer to his men and his platoon as sons to him. It is clear that the feeling is shared. This leads to another amazing juxtaposition as Tall refers to John Cusack's character, Captain Gaff, as a son to him, yet Gaff stares onward 
and does not affirm this. Tall uses this moment to talk down about his real son. Gaff never acknowledges these comments as he simply wants water for his fellow troops. There is a lot of ambiguity in the Thin Red Line. Who is right? Who is wrong? What is this great evil? Are we that evil? Is it separate? What is God? What are love and sacrifice and sacredness? The film does not want to answer these for you as much as it compels you to search for them. Do you believe the flame moving while Staros prays to be an answer from God? Or is it just a random breeze? Do you believe that wit fills the great calm before death he so greatly desired? Is Welsh's cynicism at the end an awakening? Or is it just pure nihilism? Well, the thin red line asks, what do you think? Thank you for watching this video, and if you enjoy content like this, then please go ahead and subscribe so you can join up on future explorations. Please let me know what you got out of the thin red line in the comments below, and let's discuss it. Again, thank you for watching, and I will see you all in our next exploration.